All right, y'all take a seat, and kids are welcome to go to WOW Worship. Ooh, so I typically consider myself to be a relatively self-aware person. You know, like we all have, we all have our blind spots, and I accept that. But I try to know, you know, kind of what I have to offer and what I can't, what my limitations are and my insecurities. And uh, and it just kind of frustrates me when people tend to sometimes they'll advocate something that then they seem to contradict in their own lives and so I try really hard not to do that and and I so I would love to be you know I would tell people like yeah I'm pretty self-aware and so I will never forget the day when I realized what a load of baloney that was (laughs) what kind of lie I was selling myself I was sitting in the senior pastor's office and I was the associate pastor at the time And I was describing to him this challenging situation that I was in. And so I I remember that I kind of, I analyzed it as fairly as I could. I kind of laid it out before him. I was relative, I analyzed it, I thought, fairly accurately. I was objective as I could be. And so I just kind of shared it with him. And he looked at me for a second and he goes, okay, um, how does that make you feel? And I was like, oh my gosh, this poor guy. You know, I was like, I just described this whole thing to you. So maybe if I do it a little slower this time. So I, I told him the whole thing all over again. And I went through the whole spiel and it took a few minutes. And he looked at me and annoyingly patiently and he said, I heard you. What You were telling me what you thought. I was asking you how it made you feel. And I'm just sitting there kind of like getting annoyed by this point because like, who cares how I feel, right? Like, that's not about that. It's just, here's a situation. Let's find a solution, you know? Like, I don't care. Anyway, um, so I kind of explained to him like, you know, that's beside the point. Let's talk about the real issue. And he said, no, Lindsay, I need you to be able to tell me how this makes you feel. And I realized at this point, I'm not getting out of this, right? So I better come up with something. And I'm just sitting there. I had no idea. Like, it occurred to me, like, I could not describe how this thing made me feel at all. And so we just sat there and sat there. And finally, he asked this um, really insulting but also frustratingly illuminating question. He said, Lindsay, can you please name some emotions for me? Okay, so... (laughs) Uh, like, I'm not the brightest crayon in the box. I don't have every tool in my tool belt, but I have a few. And I figured, surely, you know, this is a pretty simple thing he's asking. And for the life of me, for all the SAT words I had in my head, I could not think of any emotions at all. And so we just sat there in complete silence, minute after minute after minute. And finally, I came up with three. Do you know what they were? Happy, sad, and mad. <laughs> and that is all I could think of. And so I, so I said those. And he said, Lindsay, maybe that's something we can work on. You know? Ugh. I, by the way, a couple months ago, I texted him and I said, I am feeling disappointed about so-and-so. And I am feeling slightly abandoned over this issue. And I'm a little concerned about, and then at the end I said, aren't you so proud of me? I've come a long way. <laughs> And being a good pastor that he was, he called me, okay, what's going on, you know? Jeez, Louise, I I realized that, like, there was this part of me that was a part of my life, you know, like, everywhere I go, and yet I was totally unaware of it. I could not describe it to you for the life of me. I was 100% out of touch with my feelings, and as I, like, became aware of that, I realized, like, somewhere along the way, I had decided that to show emotion was to be kind of, like, to show weakness, and so I just, like, flipped a switch, and I I just wouldn't do it, you know, but it had made me into a person that couldn't even tell you what I was feeling if you asked me for it. Well, this week, um, I asked some friends of mine a question. I said, hey, tell me, what is your purpose in life? What is your calling from the Lord? You want to know what kind of response I got? It was just about equal to the one that I gave my senior pastor so long ago. It was like, ah, 
you know, I don't know. I'm not sure. And it made me feel better about my own, you know, lack of whatever uh, those years ago. Uh, but for the life of us, like, we just couldn't, it was hard thing to name. And just like I was walking around for years with this part of myself that I couldn't describe, I think many of us would say the same thing if we were asked, hey, what's your purpose? What is your calling? I think many of us would say, I, I don't know, you know, uh, you got me. I've got nothing for you here. And even though that made me feel better about my own, ish, like it's not great, is it? To be in the middle of living your one and only life and to not be able to say what drives you, why you're alive, what that heartbeat is down at the root of who you are. So I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit the way that he did years ago. And I want to ask you this question silently in your head. See if you can answer it. Why did God make you? And I don't mean just like somebody to do the things that you do, but I mean specifically you. It's kind of hard, isn't it? <laughs> it's a hard thing to be able to say. And hopefully there comes this day, and maybe it's even today, when we get confronted with the fact that we have been walking around completely unaware of this major part of ourselves. It feels kind of like getting hit by a truck a little bit. Like, oh my gosh, in my head, I know in my head that God has plans and purposes for me. Yes, I've read that many times. Okay, so I've had that drilled into me. But for the life of me, I am totally unaware of what it might actually be. Jeremiah had a day when he was still quite young when God revealed to him his life's purpose and his calling. And so I thought maybe if we dug into his story a little bit, that it might help shine a little light on our own. So sound good to everybody? Yeah? Okay, so go ahead and grab a Bible. If you don't have a Bible on you, then just pull up a Bible app on your phone. Jeremiah is like pretty much halfway through the Bible after Psalms and Isaiah. But it's before Ezekiel, if you're flipping around, looking for it. We're going to be in chapter 1 because, you know, his calling was at the beginning of his ministry, so it's at the beginning of the book as well. Uh, Jeremiah is called one of the major prophets. You have major prophets, you have minor prophets. They get that name based on how long their book is, <laughs> that's all. So uh, Jeremiah is a long book, so he gets counted as a major prophet. We're going to be in chapter 1, starting in verse 4 this morning. Here we go. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, uh, Lord God, truly, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a boy. But the Lord said to me, don't say I'm only a boy. For you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Don't be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. And then the Lord uh, put his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. This is the word of God for the people of God. So when Jeremiah gets this calling, is kind of told his purpose in life, he's still pretty young. And though the scripture doesn't give us much detail about what his life looked like before he got this calling, I mean like we have all of three verses before the part we just read, our best guess is that before that day when God made his purpose clear to him, he was going around in about as much days about his life's purpose as the rest of us tend to do. But then this amazing thing happens. God speaks to him. God speaks this way to us too, you know. I mean, I think sometimes we have this tendency to say like, oh, well, that's just how God acted in the Bible. That's not how things are today. That's not true, actually. There's just like this art to tuning our frequency to the right station. You know, in other words, like intentionally canceling out the noise from everything else in our lives and just being able to identify the voice of God, that combined with, it's kind of like a math equation, add to enough faith to, to believe that when we hear that voice that it is actually God who's speaking it, right? And these things together tend to be how we 
identify the voice of God in our lives through something that somebody else says or through a song that we hear or through a thought that God brings to our mind, right? God still speaks to us this way, and Jeremiah just happened to write his experience of it down for us. Jeremiah is told that his life's purpose is to be a prophet, a spokesperson for God. In other words, his uh, whole purpose in life is to point out the sins present in a culture and the natural consequences of those sins and also point to a better alternative. Jeremiah is told that God had this purpose planned for him even before he was born. Now, we read scripture to learn what God did in history. Absolutely. But it's not only for that reason. The difference between Scripture and a history book, among many other differences, is the Holy Spirit, who we believe carries the Word of God into our lives with the purpose of making our lives different than they would have been if we had never read the words before. If we really believe that God speaks to us through Scripture, it means He wasn't only sharing those words for Jeremiah, He was also sharing them for you and for me. And that means that every word from the Lord is also a call for us. We read every verse of Scripture lovingly and attentively because every verse is a potential summons from the Lord. And just like it was for Jeremiah the, that day long ago, it's true for us too. God speaks a word to us when God has an assignment. Okay? God has an assignment for us. So what potential summons does this passage present to us? First, and we got to get this first or else none of the other will sink in, but God says he knew you before you were born. Did you know that? I mean, like, he even says, I consecrated you. Do you believe that? Do you realize that when your two parents came together, that a whole lot of people could have resulted, but that God wanted you specifically? I had a friend named Gail um, who had four kids. She has four kids. Um, by the time we became friends, she was in her 60s. And she told me, you know, through the course of our friendship, she shared with me that baby number four had been unplanned. Um, a, a member of the family that they weren't expecting, some other people might have used the word accident, right? But the thing is, Gail never once used that word, ever, in her life. She always referred to her fourth child as the Lord's baby. You know, and I just thought that was lovely. And it occurs to me that some of us may have even been told the lie that we were accidents, Okay, and sure, you might have been unplanned to your parents, but you were not unplanned to God. He always knew that you were coming. He's always had a plan for you. He formed you before he knew, before you were formed, he knew you. He consecrated you for a purpose. Do you understand that? Deep down to your core, I hope if you hear nothing else today, you understand that God made you yourself all the way down to your middle name and your <laughs> color of your hair on purpose. You are no accident. You don't just happen to be here. You're not just moseying on through life. Before you were born, God had a purpose plan for you, a great work that he consecrated you to perform to aid him in his mission of taking back territory for the kingdom of God on earth. But just because we're living doesn't mean that we're living our purpose. Right? And I think it's important to acknowledge that because, well, we see people carry out terrible things all the time. I mean, we are way too familiar with the headlines, right? And that's not because they're living, that's not God's purpose for them. We need to be clear. Not everything that happens is God's plan or purpose. It's just that some folk get so disconnected from God and their God-given purpose that they feel the freedom to create one for themselves. And sometimes those folks choose evil purposes, Okay. Not everything that happens is God's plan, but it is possible for those of us who want to know it to do a little detective work and figure out God's purpose and call for ourselves. So if this is something that you're interested in, then uh, maybe open up your bulletins. You'll see a place with some notes there. This is a good definition, uh, a pretty faithful definition, I think, that we can gather from the Bible for what is a what is a calling? What is a life's purpose? Okay, so we're going to define it here this morning. A calling or a life's purpose is the common thread found weaving throughout many areas of life. Okay, so what that means is it's not just like an event. 
It's not just one job, okay? But it's a common thread found throughout many different areas of life that exists at the intersection of three things. Some past brokenness in our lives, what we're passionate about, and also God's need in the world, okay? Our calling or our life's purpose is a common thread found weaving throughout many areas of life that exists at the intersection of some past brokenness, what we're passionate about, and God's need in the world. So let's talk about that for a second. I was talking to one of those friends earlier this week, and, and she asked me the question, um, does it have to include the past brokenness? And I said, why? She's like, I don't want to deal with that stuff. And I said, I totally get that, you know? And there is something good about not being held by our pasts and being willing to kind of move forward and ahead. Um, but, but also, we've got to be able to name it. We've got to be able to articulate it because otherwise we can't allow God to redeem it, okay? And the reason I said, I'm sorry, no, God can't give us our life's purpose without our past brokenness is because our God fundamentally more than anything is a resurrection God. So he doesn't just create he, he takes things that are tending towards death, and he brings them back to life. He's a resurrection God. So he can't do that in you unless you allow him to resurrect you. You see what I'm saying? So there has to be that past brokenness there that we can deal with. Okay, then the thing that we're passionate about, you know, that could be anything. Anything that you're just excited about, that when you think of it, you can come up with a hundred different ways to do it or to use it or to... Uh, explore it, you know, whatever it is that you are just love. You just love it. And then that thing that is God's need in the world. Well, you and I know that there are plenty of needs in the world, right? There are plenty of issues that are not the way that God intended them to be in this world. And what I'm talking about specifically is that one. Maybe you have more than one, but at least that one that is such an injustice that it makes you want to pound your fist on the table, because the world is not supposed to be that way, okay? So what is that one for you? You know, we have so many um, uh, stories from the life of the Apostle Paul. We can actually see this carried out through his life, okay? So what's that past brokenness for him? Well, he was so arrogant in terms of how he believed was the right way to believe about God that he was willing to kill over it, and he did. He participated in Stephen's martyrdom, which then he greatly regretted, you know? I mean, he repented big time for that in his life. He was so sure that he was right that he was willing to kill. Okay, that's a past brokenness. What is he passionate about? He was really passionate about helping people understand this God and helping them to understand how to believe in him. And then third, what was God's need in the world? There is a whole big group of people, pretty much everybody on earth who wasn't a Jew, who did not know that they could be called a child of God, right? So you bring these three things together in his life, an arrogance that seems to still creep up every once in a while in his writings, but is mostly transformed into humility, a, passionate, a passion about helping people understand God, and this need, and what results is a man with a calling to be the missionary to the Gentiles, to let all the world know that they could have a home, you know, they could be considered a child of God. When I think about this for myself, um, I can tell you that like an area of past brokenness in my own life was that I went through a period of time where home did not feel like home for me. And I don't have to get into, like, all of the messy details of that, and you don't have to either whenever you're thinking about this for yourself or talking about it with a friend, but it's enough to say that just home didn't feel like home, okay? What am I passionate about? Hopefully this is not a surprise, but I am passionate about the church. <laughs> I love church because guess what happened for me whenever home didn't feel like home? What became home? Church did. And there were people there who were amazing and kind of took me under their wing. And I loved how a church could help solve the problems of its community. And I loved how people formed these lifelong friendships that brought richness to their lives and helped them get through hard times. And I saw that the people I admired the most had allowed themselves to be shaped and molded by their experience in church. I just loved church. 
And what was God's need in the world? I am aware that there's a lot of people who don't know that they could have a home with God. They don't know that they could be welcomed home. So you bring those three things together, and when I think about it that way, I'm like, oh, yeah, duh, because even as a college student or as a mom or in the church or in our denomination, and like what, in, what I spend my time doing is creating space for people to know that there is actually room for them to have a home with God because I believe that everyone deserves a home. Okay? Like that is my drumbeat that I march to. That, if you find me excited or energetic about something, it is always going to connect back to that because that is my calling. That's my life's purpose. You know, I told you earlier that the friends I spoke to had no idea what their purpose was. That was true except for one. One person I talked to did feel like she knew her life's purpose. And so I want to share her story with you this morning. Um, Mary Peterson is her name. She's here worshiping with us this morning. And, uh, well, I hope that you have a tissue. Uh, get ready for this one, okay? Uh, Hi, let's my name together. is Mary Peterson. And I'm doing this video because Lindsay had asked me if I would do something to explain if I knew what my purpose was, that she might do a sermon on that. And I felt like, yes, I did know my purpose. I feel like I've had a purpose my whole life. I think it became, I became aware of that when I was a child and my father, who was a very mean, abusive, alcoholic man, would beat my mother on a nightly basis and have us watch him so he could teach her a lesson. And then one night, our mother got up and killed herself in the middle of the night, leaving five children with him. And my sister and I looked at each other at the time and said, oh good, she got away from him. And I felt like I got a purpose right then and there to protect my brother and sisters and myself from that man. And I felt like I lived most of my life until I was a grown up being a protector. I felt like I was going to not let anything happen to any of us if I could protect us from him. Then, in order to learn how to be a grown-up at the age of 10, I talked to several people trying to learn how to cook and mop and clean and do the things that I should do to make my father happy so he wouldn't get angry. And I found so many wonderful people that were there to help me and guide me. And I started taking their advice. I listened to them and I learned from them. And I felt like I was doing my job. I was fulfilling my purpose. Then when I got older and I had children and I was told my first child was gonna die and if she did not die then she was going to be mentally retarded I felt like that was my purpose I was gonna have the brightest most amazing child that anyone had ever seen and then that became my purpose my children and my husband and to be a good wife and a good mother but all the people that God had put in my life I realized that were there for me were all Christians. They all went to church. And me wanting to be a good mother, I wanted to set a good example for my children. I wanted to be one of those good people. So I started going to children, to church with my children. I got baptized with my children. And it led me into a, a world of feeling my purpose and knowing what it was, which I try to still do, which is to listen, to learn, and to share. And I feel like that has been my purpose all along, was to listen to others, 
listen to God, learn what I can from others, learn what I can about God, and to share it with other people. Thank you. Sure. Talk about some strength to encounter those kinds of things in life and to be able to find purpose in it. And you'll notice like she began to identify that at a place of deep brokenness in her family's life. Uh, but then as things changed, she went through different stages. She realized that it was really the same purpose all along was to listen to folk and to listen to the Lord, to, um, to share um, what she had learned and also um, to to listen, to learn, and to share. Um, by the way, this is a purpose that she continues to carry out pretty much every day, and um, I just want to thank you for sharing your story with us, Mary. We all have a God-given purpose. If God didn't want you to be a part of what he was doing in the world, he just wouldn't have let you be born. I mean, I don't know how to say it any more simply than that. So what was a formational source of brokenness for you in your life? If you look at the bullets and there's a little like spider web thing at the bottom, you can fill it out there at home or here today. What was a formational source of brokenness in your life? What are you super passionate about? What do you just love? And what ones of God's needs in the world brings you the most frustration or sorrow or anger, whatever it is, somewhere mixed up? In all of those three things, you will locate your purpose, your calling that God has for you. Now, some of you might be thinking, you know what, that sounds good, but I'm just me. You know, like I know what I can and can't do. I know I'm not enough, whatever. Um, and I would say, sure, okay, that's fine. And you would say, I'm just a regular person. And I would say, that's okay, because God gives a purpose to every single regular person on the earth. But let's go back to scripture. Did you notice that the very first thing Jeremiah says when he's called is, ah, I can't do this, right? So like if you feel that way about yourself, then you're in pretty good company because Jeremiah felt the same way and it makes sense. Of course, any person called for divine work immediately senses their own limitations for that work. He tries to beg off. He lists his inadequacies. This is really typical. It's also really beside the point. <laughs> You know, like God is always calling people who are too young or too old or too timid or too immoral or whatever. I wonder what limitations each of us might be offering as excuses for ignoring our own call. Because the thing is, when people are not aware of their call, their purpose in life, it's usually for one of three reasons. One, either we haven't gotten to know the character of God well enough in Scripture to be able to identify God's needs. Or maybe we just don't want to have to deal with that past brokenness, so we like avoid it like the plague. Or this one, it's a big one. We don't have much self-worth. And if that applies to you, you know that it does. You know, but, oh, I'm just not. I just can't. I'm just. So how about this? Okay, for those of us who say, okay, Lindsay, this all sounds fine and nice. God probably has a plan. I'm probably a part of it, but I'm never going to figure out what it is. Then fine. Fine, maybe you were born specifically for a nice gesture that you make to a boy at the rodeo next year. Or maybe you were born for something you did at a gas station on October 20th, 2006. Or maybe you were born for a day where you interact with that one homeless man that day. Or maybe you're born for the way that you interact with your granddaughter. Fine. If you can't identify what your purpose is, that's okay. That just means you can't know your purpose, which means you better live every day like that might be the one day that you were born for, <laughs> okay? And my guess is that if you live that way, you're probably going to happen to live out your purpose along the way. Here's the thing. We have verse 9. Thank God for verse 9. I don't know what we would do without it because in verse 9, what we see is, did you notice that God touches Jeremiah's mouth? And he says, look, I'm giving you the words you need to speak. Like, I'm not just setting you up to fail, right? Like, I have a calling for you. I have a purpose. But then I'm going to give you what you need in order to accomplish it. That is true for us too, friends. If God has a purpose for you, then he's going to give you everything you need to be able to fulfill it. There's a saying about that. It goes, uh, God does not call the equipped. 
God equips the called. And that's true for every one of us. So I want you to, if you will, indulge me, repeat these words after me this morning, okay? Here we go. God made me, specifically me, for a purpose. I can know what it is. I can live it. Yes, you can. We believe in God. We love the Lord. We can live his purpose for our lives. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you didn't just, um, you weren't some kind of like clock maker who made us and then just let us go. Um, but you care enough about us. When you created us, you didn't just create us for um, fun or, you know, just because you were amused, but you actually had a purpose and a plan for every single one of us. Lord, the world gives us so many messages that we're not enough this or we can't do that, um, that it's hard sometimes to hear that voice in the back of our mind saying, you know what, no, God made me for a reason, and I'm going to live into it, Lord. And so I pray, Lord, that we would have courage like Mary uh, to be able to go back into our lives and to think, figure out and identify what is that purpose, that common thread we see woven throughout, and being able to share it with others. There's nothing to be ashamed of. It's not bragging. To be able to say, you know what, this is who I am. This is who God made me. This is what I'm about. Help us to live with that kind of confidence and boldness as children of God. Lord, in this time in our service, we are actually really grateful to be able to um, give a portion of what you've given to us back to you. We see you doing some pretty amazing things like the 82 cards that the congregation um, designed and put together and were sent to kids in El Paso just this week. We pray, Lord, that you would take the gifts from glad and generous hearts today and that you would use them in ways we can't even imagine right here in our church, um, throughout our community, and really around the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray.